Good afternoon. Hi. I'm here today with former Representative Joseph Rhodes, Jr., who is a Democrat who represented Allegheny County and the 24th District from 1973 to 1980. I'd like to thank you for coming in today. My pleasure. Uh, I'd like to start off with asking you a little bit about yourself. Tell me a little bit about your family, your background, and your education before you came into the House of Representatives. Well, my mom and my dad met in the war, the big war in the Philippines in 45. So my mom's a Filipino Chinese person, was a Filipino Chinese person. She just died last November. And my father was an Afro-American. And they met and hit it off. And uh, she stayed in the Philippines while he went back to the States to have their baby, which turns out to be my older brother, huh? Eduardo. And then she went on this horrendous trip from the Philippines to Pittsburgh. And she'd never been anywhere. I mean, she's country, country, you know. And she got on a boat and f with her newborn baby, and uh, she sailed to San Francisco and got off the boat and got on a train and took a train to Pittsburgh. And I always call myself a hello baby, because when they got together in Pittsburgh, I was born nine months to the day after oh. that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How about uh, your education? You have a quite diverse educational background. Can well, I, I went to Pittsburgh Public Schools, mm -hmm. which were a wonderful school system. Uh, we had a great superintendent. And uh, one of the things they believed in, which is you, you couldn't even find that today, was that every student should have an opportunity to play a musical instrument oh. in the whole district. Yeah. We had lots of bands and lots of orchestras, and that's how I learned to play the violin. I played in all city orchestras since I was elementary school, all city, then junior, and then high school, all city. I got to the third stand outside uh, of the first violins. Uh, I was very interested in science and history when I was in uh, high school. Uh, I've always been interested in history. And then uh, Toward the end of my high school life, I was a a invited to be a member of a National Science Foundation program at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, mm -hmm. which was for, quote, gifted science high school kids. There's 25 of us. We went down to Charlottesville. I've never been south like that. I've been to Mobile where my dad was born, but never been on my own in the south. And uh, uh, I worked on the nuclear reactor for the summer of 64. Uh, and I came back from that, and I, I got all excited about nuclear physics. So I applied to Caltech in Pasadena and MIT because I wanted to be a physicist. So uh, I got admitted to both. So I was at a conference at West Point, of all places, and uh, the featured speaker was J. Robert Oppenheimer. <laughs> and there were all these generals standing around him and everything. And uh, I thought, what a disgraceful d demonstration by these generals. They made his life misery. <laughs> and here they all, all glad handing him, you know. But I snuck up to him and I said, I said, Dr. Oppenheimer, I've been admitted to Caltech and to MIT and I want to be a physicist. Where should I go? He said, there's Jerry Wine oh, w Wisner, who was the provost at MIT. He said, so I'll tell you quietly. He said, go to Caltech. <laughs> <laughs> he had a big influence. I had other influences on me that are not as, you know, highfalutin as that. Yeah. Why I went to California. So I enrolled at Caltech in 65, graduated in 69. Uh, and my last year, uh, my uh, advisors told me, you can't finish in physics because you, you kept postponing these 300-level courses. You have to, so if you were to finish in physics, you'd have to take three 200-level courses, all graduate courses in physics. And you can't do it. Nobody can do that. I said, oh, well, what can I do? And he says, well, take, change, change your major to history. You do something in history. So I said, okay. So I went to the history department and sat down with Dr. Huttenbach, who was history professor and master of student housing. And I said, Dr. Huttenbeck, uh, they say I have to become a history major to graduate. What, should, what kind of history should I do? He said, well, do you speak any languages? I said, no, just English. He said, well, that confines you to English history or American history. <laughs> Since I'm an imperial 
a British imperial scholar in terms of the empire, I suggest you pick English history. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay. So I became a uh, history major in uh, British imperial history. And then he put a question to me. He said, one question of all, for your thesis. I said, I've been wondering about all my life is why were there, why was so many English people in the middle of the 19th century so racist? What was, what was the underlying thing? I said, I don't know. So he said, well, take that on, you know. So he gave me a big stack of books, all the famous British imperialists, like Lugard and Livingston, Chinese Gordon, all these guys. And being a good Caltech physics major, I, every time I read through the books, I had a little notebook. I took time. Every time I thought there was a racist comment, I, you know, I put it in my little notebook. Yeah. And then at the end of it, I wrote this thesis. It was about 70 pages long, all about how they became racist. And one morning, I was taking a shower in Blacker House. By the way, they, I think it was purposeful they put me in Blacker House. But I, I was the only black student at Caltech for two years. Uh, and I was taking a shower, and all of a sudden I went, oh, no. And I wiped myself off and ran across the uh, Olive Walk to get hold of Professor Huttenbach. I said, Dr. Huttenbach, my thesis is all wrong. He says, why, well, what's wrong with it? He says, I said, none of these guys were racist. <laughs> I've written this. He said, they had to be. Of course they were. I said, I'm telling you, I was trained as a physics major to look at the evidence. And the evidence says they weren't racist. So what am I going to do? He says, well, you better come up with a theory about why they weren't racist because they should have been. <laughs> so I wrote, I came up with this theory called, called the theory of uh, residual values. And I wrote it up in my thesis. And I defended it. And the faculty agreed with it. And, uh, I graduated from Caltech. Uh, I almost didn't graduate because the last course I took at Caltech was in statistics and probability theory and I flunked it because I didn't go to any of the classes. The reason was I was president of the student body for two years oh. and Governor Reagan was waging war on students, on you know, people who resisted him and resisted the war. So I had to go to a lot of different places. A lot of people got hurt. I don't know why people idolize Reagan. He was a monster. But uh, anyway, I couldn't. I didn't pass my uh, last course in statistics. And it came up in front of the faculty that I, 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 they'd have to waive my, these four credits I needed out of two hundred and some odd number of credits. So I was very moved by the number of faculty that stood up and said. If anybody deserves to graduate from Caltech, Joe Rhodes does. <laughs> so so they, wow. they, they waived the four credits and I graduated. Yeah. And uh, one of the, my professors at Caltech, uh, jo Professor Benton, who was a history professor, that he had sent my, my uh, essay on the residual value theory on the Harvard for consideration. Meanwhile, I was all gearing up to become a Rhodes Scholar because mm -hmm. I went out for football only because uh, you, the Rhodes Scholarship required demonstration of proficiency. I quote it, demonstration of proficiency in a manly sport. So I went out for football because the coach came up to me at freshman camp and said, you should go out for football. I said, you're only saying that because I'm black. And I'm the only black guy in the whole class. Said, no, 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 you, have, you look like you. Anyway, I played on the football team for four years. We won one game my senior year, and that was one game out of four years. Oh, no. <laughs> but I got one of the game balls, even though I only played one play. But I always, you know, wanted to be a Rhodes Scholar. And then all of a sudden I got a telegram from Harvard saying, uh, we've reviewed your material and we think you'd be a good nominee for the Society of Fellows, Junior Fellowship. Uh, and would you send us some copies of your best published work? Well, the only thing I'd ever published was an article in the California Tech newspaper about the football team. <laughs> so I think, you know, I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. So the next thing I know, the faculty calls me and the history faculty calls me and I said, Joe, why haven't you responded to Harvard? I says, well, they're not going to make me a junior fellow. They said, I said, they said, respond, go to Cambridge. So I responded, I went to Cambridge. I explained to them that uh, my interests were not purely academic. I was interested in trying to change the way higher education functioned in the country. And, and as an aside, I was inter interested in Victorian intellectual history and the theory of residual values, which I invented. So I walked back to the Society of Fellows headquarters, and I went up to the uh, 
secretary there who was Elizabeth Hill, a wonderful woman. I said, can you change my, my return ticket to pa Pasadena because, I, you know, I'm not, they don't want me hanging around here. They said, Joe, they just appointed you. <laughs> You're a junior fellow. I said, what? <laughs> so that's how I became a junior fellow at, mm -hmm. at Harvard, their youngest and only black at that point. And uh, that's, so my education moves into other circles. Then I, I started my academic interest trying to expand to understand why racism had the effects it had in Victorian society and how it evolved. And the only person that wrote anything on this subject that made sense to me was Walter Houghton at Wellesley, who, who wrote a book on the Victorian frame of mind, which is a beautiful book. So I called him up one day. I said, Professor Houghton, I'm Joe Rhodes. I'm a junior fellow at Harvard. I'd like to come talk to you about Victorian racism. He said, come on out. So, so I went out to his office at Wellesley. And he said, you know, you know, I, I wonder when the first time that phrase racism was ever used. I said, I don't know. So he goes to his library. He starts pulling down books. And I'm, with, I'm helping him pull down books. And we're, we're going through all these books. And he, he found it. Racism was used by the French in the late 19th century. And I thought, this is a great guy. I've got to work with him. So for three years, he and I worked together on my concept. Anyway, that's my educational background. Well, how about uh, transitioning into how did that uh, afford you work opportunities and your, your past work experiences before coming to the house? None. Had no effect. Nobody wants to hire a Victorian intellectual historian. <laughs> that's, uh, you know. What happened was uh, I had this experience on the Scranton Commission. This was a commission President Nixon appointed to investigate the killings at Kent State and Jackson State. And because I was on good good relations with John Ehrlichman, because he had used me to, now I use, don't, I don't take the, use, the word used, you know, in the kind of typical degrading sense. He worked with me, he used me to figure out certain things when there were big demonstrations going on. I was always concerned about the loss of life since I remember, I remember uh, Reagan had set up a situation in Berkeley where got James Rector killed uh, at People's Park. Anyway, after Kent State and Jackson State, President Nixon and Ehrlichman called me up and asked me if I'd be on a commission to investigate that. And I said, well, what the hell is this commission about? He said, we're going to investigate why this happened. I said, what's the name of the commission? The Commission on Student Violence. The Commission on Student Violence? Are you going to investigate how the students ran on the bullets? <laughs> and they did violence to the buckshot? <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. You better change the name. So Ehrlichman called me back and said, the president agreed to change the name of the com Commission on un Campus Unrest if you agree to be on it. I talked it over a lot of my friends at Harvard. They all thought I was crazy. They all considered the Nixon administration like war criminals. You know, I said, but if I can save one life, I should try it. I should do it. So I agreed. I did it. Two weeks after I was appointed, Vice President Agnew called for my uh, my. Uh, exit. I mean, he, he wanted the president to fire me because uh, I had said some things to the New York Times about uh, what I wanted to investigate. I called the White House up about it, and Earl from got on the phone and said, "Is this the famous Joe Rhodes?" <laughs> I said, "It's me, Mr. Earl." I just told the truth. I want to know why these cops and National Guardsmen thought they could just shoot at students like, shoot them down like dogs. I'd like to know why, what made them do it. And did something you or the president said about, or the vice president said about students calling them bums and all that, did that encourage the police to think they could shoot students with Im Im immunity? And uh, he said, Joe, you just keep, you're doing a good job, just keep at it. So all that summer of 70, I was attacked by all kinds of people. The congressmen got up in the house and they attacked me. Uh, I got sent a, 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 a canister of pennies, and, and the note said, "This we, we got together and we decided uh, we would pick up a collection to send you back to Africa, you nigger." And I thought I took the pennies and my buddies. We went to a, a local bar and we had two or three beers on these guys' pennies, <laughs> on the pennies. A lot of things like then a lot of other things. I got like a hundred death threats and stuff like that. Um, but because of that, I had notoriety. <laughs> and the Scranton Commission report is a good report. You read it today, it's, it's alive. It was talking about what was going on in 1970, how serious everything was. People were going to be hurt. After that, uh, 
I was talking to some people from my hometown, Pittsburgh, and they said, why don't you come back and run for public office, be a state representative? I said, I don't know anything about, I don't know anything about being a state representative. And they said, well, just, you know, you, you'll figure it out. So being a, a young black guy from Pittsburgh, and the credo in Pittsburgh was the young, bright, young black guys and women, they all leave and never come back. So I said, being half black and half Asian, um, you have a special tug on you. They can grab you, make you, I want to be, prove that I'm as good as any other black. So I said, I'll go back and I ran for office. I spent $2,000, I think, in my campaign in 72, and I won by three to one. Yeah. So that was my first term in the House. That's how I got in politics. I asked them, they, they were going around talking about committee assignments. I said, I'd like to be on, I don't think I know what the legislature is that you deal with highways, and highway safety interests me. And the leadership people told me, are you nuts, Rhodes? <laughs> the, highway, the transportation committee is where all the you know, stuff goes on. <laughs> you, you can't be on that committee. So they put me on judiciary, mm -hmm. and w what was called ways and means. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into politics. Let's backtrack a second. How did, what influences shaped you to become a Democrat then? I was not registered till I, I, the first time I ran, the first time I registered was when I was running so I could vote yeah. for myself. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I wasn't a politician type. I mean, I was a, a nerd. I was from Caltech and the Harvard Society of Fellows. I wasn't interested in politics. But I saw a lot of things. And, uh, I was there when James Rector was killed, and uh, the country was bleeding. It was a lot of wounds, and I felt I could do something. I was brought up as a Christian to believe you're supposed to try to do what you can do. So, and nobody in my family was anything but a Democrat, so okay. I became a Democrat. Yeah. Well, did you enjoy campaigning then? I loved it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I found out lots of times things. Every I ran four times for the House and once for the United States Senate in, in '80. And every time I uh, was oh, you know, was up for election, all my people would say, "You don't need to campaign, Joe. You always win with 90 percent of the vote. <laughs> what, are you, what are you campaigning for?" I says, "Well, I get to know the district, and I go around knock on doors." The what reason I got involved with uh, unlicensed boarding homes is one day I was working, I was cam canvassing my district up in Lincoln Park, Penn Hills Township, which just north of Pittsburgh. And uh, I knocked on the door, no answer. I knocked it again, door open, and this frail person came up. And I said, well, I'm here running as your state representative, re-election. She said, well, come on in. I said, okay. So I went in, and I start walking around. The place stank. It had a odor that would blow you away, you know? Yeah. And then I noticed all these people lying in beds uh, with bed sores and, you know, moaning and everything. I thought, what the, is this? And they said, it's a boarding home. I said, this ain't no boarding home. So from that day on, I fought uh, to get the boarding homes under license, which they are now. Mm -hmm. I'm proud to say. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I made it happen, but I uh, was part of it. There were a lot of people who were concerned in addition to me. Well, how has your district changed over time then? It's gotten bigger, bigger. geographically, mm -hmm. because the, the city lost population, and mm -hmm. so you had to span the districts. Now it goes into Point Breeze, and, uh, even further than that. But uh, the 24th, that's my district. Mm -hmm. how, did, uh, how do you see yourself, uh, how, how was your relationship with yourself and your constituents over that time? You said you knocked on a lot of doors, and. Yeah. Um, you came up on a lot of issues. Um, and, and whenever I went out in the district, I always, campaigning or not, I always found something that they need. I had a rule, by the way, which was if I'm ever in the district and I see a police car or, or a fire engine going with lights and sirens, I jump my car and I follow, go through lights and everything, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, i never forget one night I went to visit the 13th Ward uh, committee women. Uh, you know, and so I walked in this, uh, I was on Frankstown Avenue, which is the main drag in home, Homewood. So I, I walked in this uh, place, and they were all the committee women, you know. Mm -hmm. And they just beat me upside the head like you wouldn't believe. 
Joe, you're never here. You, you're always in Harrisburg. I said, but you elected me to go to Harrisburg. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I'm not, I'm not a social worker at home. With, I'm supposed to represent your interests in Harrisburg. Oh, Joe, you've forgotten your roots. You don't care. I said, okay, okay. Uh, they all love me, by the way. They, they, I never lost a district in the 34th and four times. I walked out of the club. I think it was the Metropolitan Club. I forget where. And as, as I walk out, this police car goes flying by with lights and sirens. <laughs> so... I jump in my car and I follow them. And they go up to Oak, uh, Oakwood and Frankstown Avenue. And there's a bar there on the corner. And it's a couple of police cars and lights and everything. So I go in and uh, there's this guy lying on the floor. He had his throat slit. Oh, no. <laughs> Blood's everywhere. The cops are trying to tell people to get back, get back. And I said, hey, people, listen to the cops. What are you doing? Back up. Give them and, and some of those guys were half drunk and they looked at me like, are you nuts? You, you know, I said, look, I'm your state rep. You back off. Let these cops do their job. And I bent down to see if this guy was oh, dead or something. I fell out of the hole in his neck. But it was right where it was sliced. You know, he was dead as a doughnail. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went home that night and I, as I came through the door, my wife then, Linda Colvin Rhodes, who became the Secretary of Aging in the, in the uh, Casey administration, she stood she me and said, what happened to you? I was all covered with blood. Oh, no. <laughs> I said, well, honey, it's just like this. I mean, I went to this meeting of the committee women in the 13th floor who were telling me I'm not involved in the community. <laughs> and then I had to go up to, oh, no. to this bar. So, I mean, my relationship with the community was pretty good. I remember one time I was in the, uh, my office, which is way up under the eaves of the Capitol, fifth floor. Somebody runs and says, Representative Rhodes, you got to go downstairs because there's, there's all kinds of trouble in front of the Capitol. I said, what kind of trouble? And I said, well, there's all these welfare people trying to get into the Capitol, and they've broken the little lady's arm in, in this revolving door, and it's going to get terrible. I said, oh, me. So I ran downstairs. <laughs> There it was, hundreds and hundreds of people outside the front door of the Capitol. And all the Capitol Police all lined up. So I went up to the Capitol Police captain. I said, what's going on here? He says, well, these people want to come in. They can't. I says, do you understand you work for these people? They're, they're constituents. They're tax. They own this building. <laughs> you can't block them. Mm -hmm. They don't have an appointment. I said, so I grabbed a flyer from one of the people, and I wrote on it, to whoever may concern, everybody in front of the Capitol right now has an appointment with me right now, Representative Joe Rhodes. I gave it to them. Now they have an appointment. <laughs> so uh, they all start streaming into the Capitol. And uh, I had to find a place to put them. So I ran up to the E floor. Uh, I tried to find a, a room. I finally got to the Minority Caucus room. And uh, it was full of Farmers, because Representative Kent Shellhammer was having some farmers meeting. Mm -hmm. Wonderful guy. Absolutely reliable. As true as the driven snow. And I went to Kent, and I said, Kent, you got to get out of here. I need this room. And he says, why? I said, don't ask questions. I said, just trust me. Get everybody out of here. He said, okay, Joe. He said, let's leave, everybody. So I went downstairs, and all these people were down and wrote, you know, middling in the rotunda. And I said, come with me. So they all went upstairs and went into the minority caucus room. So then I go down the steps, make sure everybody got in, and I look to the Senate side of the Capitol, and there was this big trooper, state troopers, a big platoon or whatever, of state troopers in riot gear, great big long batons, you know. And I, I went to the first person, it was a sergeant, I think, and they all meant well, I, you know. They said, I said, why are you here? We're here to keep the peace. I said, look, sergeant, you want to keep the peace, leave the building, okay? I'm Representative Joe Rhodes. I represent a lot of these people. They have, they have a proper question to put to the legislature. So just leave. I said, just go down here and go out the Senate door. Just, so I pushed him a little. <laughs> and he backed up a little. And he gave me this look in the eye like, you pushed me one more time, sir. I'm going to open you up from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. <laughs> but I kept pushing him. And they kept moving out. And uh, they moved out of the building. So I ran up to the minority caucus room, and there's all these people, you know, milling around. And, everything. and then there was a very wonderful community activist named Fannie Lou Hamer, who was, in the, who was leading this whole group from Pittsburgh. And as I walked in, she shouts out to me, Oh, there's our representative, Joe Rhodes. 
Are you with us or against us? And then I said something intemperate, <laughs> which was basically telling her where she could go. <laughs> and, but I, I, I did my duty. My duty was for the people, and I did it that day. And uh, later on, she, she ran into me and said, Joe, I'm really sorry I said that. I said, so I'm, I'm sorry what I said. You know, it was a heated situation, but I was mostly concerned about the safety of these people. She says, I know you were. So I always won my legislative seat by 90% of the vote, 80%, something like that. Sometimes nobody ran against me. <laughs> yeah. What did you think of the Capitol the first time you came in? Or on swearing in day, what kind of feeling did you have then? I, 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 I kind of screwed up on swearing in day. Cause I, I didn't know that was what it meant. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. So I, I, I come to the floor of the house, and this, there's all these flowers on the on the mm -hmm. desk on swearing and day. And I didn't have anybody there with flowers, so I'm, I put in a resolution. This will date me. I put in a resolution to memorialize the Congress to stop the bombing of Haiphong Harbor in Hanoi. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, after we were sworn in, I jumped up to the mic and. I, Total novice. Oh, what a little kid. I jumped up and I said, Mr. Speaker. And the speaker recognized me. His name was Ken Lee, wonderful guy from Eaglesmere. Mr. Speaker, I call up House Resolution 1. And then people all over the floor said, We're out of here to do business today. What, what is, what's this guy doing? You know? And Ke Ken Lee, bless his soul, he said, We are all sworn in. We are the House representatives of the Commonwealth. The member has a resolution he wants to put before us. It is before us. And so the House resolution was in front of us. And we started debating Vietnam for about an hour. Wow. <laughs> and the guy that That's gave incredible. me the most trouble on the floor was Jack Murtha. He, he would just came back from Nam and you know, he, they, he just cut me a new one. We were going at it, you know. But, but the issue got in front of the people, got in front of the House. That's what I was trying to do. Years later, he and I became, I would say, Good friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was swearing in day for me. <laughs> you talked about uh, a couple issues already, boarding homes and, and uh, the war in Southeast Asia. What are some of the other issues uh, that you felt were, were personal for you or that you fought for throughout your time here in the House? Almost every issue I got involved in, I stumbled into. <laughs> I didn't mean it. One day, Representative Jim Kelly, who's a Republican from North Hills of Pittsburgh, who he and I became I would say good friends. He asked me, a uh, bunch of us are going over this, to uh, Western Penitentiary to check it out. Uh, you want to come with us? I said, sure. So we went over to West Penitentiary, knocked on the door. <laughs> There's a lot of doors to get into Western Penitentiary. And we went all around the prison, and we got to this one section called the hole by the guys. But it's technically the behavioral adjustment unit. It's a segregated area for the bad actors. And. Uh, we went down there, and all the prisoners were all bleeding and had, you know, all kinds of, they were all beat up. So we both got all excited and called up Attorney General Kane. We wanted an investigation of what happened. And then it, as it turned out, they are just putting on this show for us. They had stabbed themselves and stuff, you know. But I didn't react like, I wasn't mad at them. I didn't react like that. My reaction was, if things are so bad here, it would drive men to do this, then what, there's something wrong here. And from that day forward, I had an interest in prisons. Later on, I became chairman of the Committee on Crime and Corrections. I spent a lot of time in prison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did all I could to make it better. But no one person, not even the governor, could really fix it all. Uh, people think of imprisonment as a safe, simple solution. But it's not. Mm -hmm. We had 6,000 guys in prison when I was in the legislature. I think they have like 40,000 in prison now, yeah. and things aren't better. You can't lock up people and hope that'll solve everything. It just doesn't work that way. So that's how I got into that. And then uh, the other major thing I got involved in was juvenile justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't recall how I got into that. I think someone from Neighborhood Legal Services got me interested in that. So I got in deeply into how we treat juveniles under the law in Pennsylvania. And there was terrible flaws in the law. And so I put in a bill with Sec Representative Sirica, who's Tony Sirica is now the third president of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. You know, he was my buddy. We put this bill in, which would totally change how you treat juveniles. And uh, 
long story short, it passed after much effort, believe me, uh, and became the model legislation for the whole country, wow. was my Juvenile Act. Fantastic. And uh, again, I stumbled into it. Uh, my other big area I worked on was cr organized crime and, pu and public corruption. And I got into that because in 77 or 78, we had a lot of public corruption issues in the Commonwealth, and there was a lot of mob activity. I talked to the state police and others about, you know, what, do we, what can we do to get into this fight? And the thing that really bothered me the most was we were at the mercy of the feds. You know, they would have an interest in it, and then they, the interest would move somewhere else. They would start really clamping it on organized crime, then they get another interest someplace else, and they go someplace else. I said, our, our, uh, what do you call them? Uh, our uh, attorney generals and uh, district attorneys, mm -hmm. our prosecutorial uh, function, needs to be armed with the right tools, and they don't have the power to do a wiretap. And they don't have the power of a grand jury system. So I proposed that with the help of Representative Sirica and uh, others. Mike Riley, someone I hired from Pittsburgh out of the DA's office, he was the chief of our staff. And we conducted this investigation into organized crime, public corruption. Uh, leadership fought me tooth and nail. They tried to cut my money out. They tried to do anything they could. And uh, we prevailed. And... Uh, the bills came to the calendar, you know, creating the grand jury system, mm -hmm. creating the wiretap system, creating the new statutes on public corruption. And I, I got up on the floor and I, I moved to bring up House Bill, whatever it was, you know. Uh, the then majority leader called me down to the desk, uh, Jimmy Mandarino. He says, he says, look, Joe, you've won. So. If I don't make any more objections, will you not make any more speeches? <laughs> and I said, sure, Jim. So I went back. I just called them up, and they all passed. And that's how we have the current system to fight organized crime, public corruption. Those were the main issues that I worked on. There were some other minor ones. I got a lot of laws in, in place. I was going to say you had nine bills passed in eight years of service, which is remarkable. You know, and over seven, I think, seven resolutions adopted. In that, in that amount of time, that's that's you have you have to be uh, relentless to get any kind of legislation through the general assembly or any legislative body. It's just very very hard, especially if it's going against the grain, trying to you know up in previous practice like my organized crime legislation was. I remember I put a bill in once uh, on paternity, completely off the side. You know, it's something I found out about, and under the old law. Uh, if a guy was charged with being the father of somebody, all he had to do was opt, get his lawyer to opt to have it uh, heard in the criminal court because there was an option to go to the criminal court instead of the p civil courts. Right. Mm -hmm. And since the criminal court has a requirement of proof, which was beyond a reasonable doubt, at that time there was no way to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that anybody was anybody's father. So that w they always got off on that. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I put a bill in it, eliminating the criminal option, you know. And I got jacked up <laughs> in the cloakroom. Guys would come up to me and say, what is wrong with you, Rhodes? Are you a sissy? What's going on? I said, it's right. If you play, you have to pay. It's right. Women should have this option. Mm -hmm. It passed. It's still law. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's the way it is. Out of all of these accomplishments, which piece of legislation are you most proud of then? I don't know how I would gauge. I'm very proud of the Juvenile Justice Legislation, Act 41. I'm very proud of my organized crime and public corruption investigate. Every time I see a grand jury doing something or a wiretap or something, I said, there it goes, that's what I did. But I was also proud of little things, not legislation. like. I told you I learned a lot from canvassing my district. Right. One day I was working in Penn Hills, uh, you know, canvassing, knocking on doors, and I said, God, that stinks. What is that? And one of the guys with me went, look at that. And there's this raw sewage running down uh, the sidewalk, you know, in a little ditch. I said, what the hell? <laughs> so I 
I got in f touch with the people who lived there, and they said, we've been trying to get secondary sewage, sewage here for years. They won't give us, we can't get it done. It's too expensive, blah, blah, blah. So then I found out that every year, the state had this big budget to allocate for uh, sewage treatment. Mm -hmm. and it was you know, like Alcasan, big, big projects. So I went to the secretary uh, that was involved in that, and I said, I nearly need you to give me my, my sewers. He said, no, we, we, don't, we can't jump you guys. So he was on the Penn State board with me. <laughs> I was on the Penn State board. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Shap put me on that, but he did. I had nothing to do with Penn State. You know, I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm, you know, I'm a pit rooter. You know? But anyway, I was on the Penn State board. And every, at every board meeting, I raised my hand, and the president of the board would say, OK, Joe, what do you want? We know what you want. I said, yes. I said, Mr. Secretary, when are you going to give me my secondary sewages in Penn Hills Township? You know, he said, Joe, I, I'm getting to it. You know, finally, many years later, he, I said that, Mr. Secretary, when are you going to give me my sewers in Penn Hills? He said, read the latest report on the allocation. So I went and got it, and it said, Alcasan, $32 million and blah, blah, blah. The, Philadelphia, the Southeast, Southeastern Pennsylvania Sewage Authority, $28 million. And it said, Township of Penn Hills, $815. $815,000. Then it said, next one was some other place, you know, $2 million, I mean, $20 million. <laughs> and, we, and I go back there, people still remember me that I got them their sewers. Mm -hmm. That's concrete, literally. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it really mattered. I like getting things done for people. In the, in the years I served in the House, I only submitted four uh, citations to the Legislative Reference Bureau. You know, most members, they, they, they generate hundreds of these things, people's weddings, their anniversaries, or anything. but I only introduced four, and they were always for one thing. It was always for a child a youngster who had done something heroic. Mm -hmm. And we'd have a little banquet for him, and, you know. I, I'll never forget the first one. It was a kid who was in a school bus going down the parkway east, and the, the truck, the bus driver, had a fatal heart attack, and they're going along at 60 miles an hour. And uh, this little kid, he's like, you know, 10 years old or something, you know, he jumps into the driver's seat, he starts driving the bus, and he asked some other kid to push the brake with his hands, because they couldn't reach the brake. Right, yeah. And he gets the bus over to the berm, you know? What a brave kid. That's I had, phenomenal. every one of those was a story like that. The legislative reference people, whenever I called them, they'd send somebody down. They said, your, we always look forward to your, your citations, because they always are meaningful, when we really will do a good job on yours. Mm -hmm. So. That's you know the broad, the broad range of legislative job. You know, I run down the street and chase police cars. I try to reward or acknowledge the hero heroism of my kids. I try to pass the laws that should be passed. Uh, I did my duty. How about your uh, leadership positions, especially within the committees? You were vice chairman in finance, like you said, you were a subcommittee chairman on crimes and corrections. Um, what kind of things uh, in your committee, in your committee work, can you talk about? Well, being vice chairman of finance meant nothing mm -hmm. because the Ways and Means, which became the Finance Committee, mm -hmm. was never, what it worked on was so important, it was never given any authority. <laughs> the tax laws, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So when we had a tax bill uh, law coming up, they would send it to us at the last minute, all done. And we were supposed to all vote for it passed along to, to, to the full house. So it was, it, it was no discussion. It was, you know, so being vice chairman of the finance committee was uh, not much of a job. Uh, chairman of the committee on crime and corrections, that was a big job. I shared that job with Tony Sirica. He's a great guy. He, he had a real heroic sense of justice. And uh, well, we passed good laws. And uh, the sad, one of the saddest things that happened uh, to me in that whole arena was one year we passed the ERA uh, constitutional amendment in Pennsylvania and one of our representatives uh, was in charge of that and she put in a whole series of bills to end all kind of discrimination in, in the uh, statutes mm -hmm. 
but it was like a computerized thing. No, no one really read, because there was hundreds and hundreds of statues going back to the 1600s, right? right? Okay. One of the statues they repealed was a statute, because the front of the statute, it said, uh, uh, women in state prisons uh, would not get clothing or something like that, hmm. as, a, as opposed to men who would get it. And, you know, stupid. It's done in the 1800s. You know. So her m bill abolished that statute, but she forgot to notice that another section of the statute gave the legislature the right to make unannounced inspections and the Philadelphia Prison Society to make unannounced inspections of prisons. Prisons are bad enough, believe me. But if they go unmonitored, there are hell holes. The most important thing for the legislature was to monitor the prison, make sure that the prison right. wardens and all knew that at any moment a member could show up mm -hmm. and to say, knock on the door and say, by authority, of the blah, 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 I want to have access to this prison. I want to see everybody. Well, we accidentally did that, and the legislature has never repaired that damage. A lot of people tried, but... Mm -hmm. Governors love it that we took away that authority from ourselves. So I'm, I regret that very much. You have to really be vigilant if you're a legislator. I mean, you have to risk things. You have to go out and look at things that nobody wants to look at. Otherwise, you have dark societies in the, in the Commonwealth where nobody sees and anything can happen to them. I mean, one time I went to a Penn State football game. First time and only time, because I, I was on the board, but I didn't care about watching football. I played football in college, and I didn't like watching it. Uh, but uh, I went there with a person who became my wife later on, and uh, we're driving back from Penn State, and we passed Muncie, because it's on the road back mm -hmm. from Penn State. Yeah. And I said, do you mind if I pull over here? This is like 10 o'clock at night. I said, do you mind if I pull over here? and uh, just, I'm going to go over and see what's going on. She said, no, go ahead. So I pull up, and I get out. I go, I go up to the door, and I look around. There she is standing right next to me. I said, I said you can't. This is not for you to see. She said, just go and get in the pr prison. I said, all right. So I <laughs> rang the thing. And guard comes out, and I said, I'm State Representative Joseph Rhodes under House Resolution so-and-so. I demand immediate admission to this institution if you don't. Let me in in five minutes, you'll be in contempt of the house, and you'll be in a state institution tomorrow. Believe me. So there's a big jumble, and five minutes later, a whole bunch of people come down. It's like late at night, and they open up the place. And uh, they say, you want to go see the infirmary? I said, no. You want to go see the uh, cafeteria? I said, no. I want to see the hole. That is the heart of any prison, mm -hmm. how the worst are treated. So just. Show me the way. <laughs> so we went to the whole the behavioral adjustment unit. Every institution had one. And I, the, most of the cells are empty, you know. We go down. And we get to the end one, and there's this black woman huddled like this, shivering in the corner, totally drenched. I went up, I knocked on the, I said, open this gate, <laughs> open this, <laughs> this cage. So the guard opens it. I go up to her and I said, ma'am, what happened to you? Oh, leave me alone, leave me alone. I said, what happened to you? Oh, they, they used the fire hose on me for the last hour. I said, they bounced you around in the cell with a fire hose? She said, yeah, that's what they did. So you're not going to do anything about it. So I, I said, you just sit there. What's wrong with your, your, your wrist? They're, they're, oh, I cut them. Turns out that she had, they suspect her of having contraband, like marijuana or something, mm -hmm. in her very personal area. And so they uh, pulled her into the infirmary and spread her legs on this table two big guys, and they want to probe her, you know, to see if there's anything in there. And she jumped off the bed and smashed her hands through the window, which was all barred, so that she couldn't have gotten away. <laughs> but she was just so terrified that she busted the windows and the shards cut her up and everything. So uh, I said, I want to see the warden right now. So they got the warden. He didn't want to see me. And... Uh, <laughs> Let's just say that there were some changes made at Muncie Prison after that. Uh, you have to go when they don't expect you. Right. Otherwise, you don't see anything. And you've got to believe it's your job. You're a representative of the people, not just your district, but of the people of the Commonwealth. And you have to go out and represent them. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the job. <laughs>
How about uh, with uh, so much of your legislation being passed in the law, how, so much is talking about now about bipartisanship and working both sides of the aisle. Did you, how, did, how did you do that to get laws passed and when you're in the majority or the minority? We had a rule in my committee, the subcommittee on crime and corrections. Tony Sirica, who's now a Third Circuit Court of Appeals president judge, he and I had one staff. They all worked together. And when the Republicans took over, he was, quote, the chairman, but I was the co-chairman. When the Democrats took over, I was the chairman, and he was the co-chairman. We all, we did everything together. I believe that uh, there's no place for bitter partisanship over certain things. Now, some things is naturally going to be partisan, like the budget. But, you know, I never got into the budget much. Uh, I had a lot of friends on the Republican side, and... Uh, I never thought that was a stigma that they were Republicans. I mean, we were together for the benefit of the people. I remember when we were uh, pushing the organized crime and public corruption package through the House, Tony and I. People will stand up in, in, the, in our caucus and call me names I can't repeat, questioning my manhood in relation to Sirica. And I'd say, you, I can't say what I said. <laughs> Basically, just told him, you know, leave off of that because we don't want to get any fisticuffs here in the, in the caucus. <laughs> uh, but I love that guy. He and I did good work. And he's been a great judge, Tony Sirica. But, you, you know, you can, have, you can be very partisan if you want to be, mm -hmm. but you won't get anything done. <laughs> and, and the Commonwealth, you know, 12 million people, there's a lot that needs to be done. You know, laws have to be extinguished and laws have to be enacted. <laughs> right. Well, so much is uh, different now in terms of the way the legislature is either run or uh, in terms of technology and things like that. Uh, what are some of the things that you think are beneficial now that may help the legislature run better? Or are there uh, some things in your time that you thought uh, should have stayed around longer or, or, or things are run better? Technology is a simple one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Jack Murtha, who's now a very distinguished member of the United States Congress, he was totally loved in the entire assembly for one reason. <laughs> he managed to convince leadership to install a phone in every member's home that they could use, you know, with dialing eight to call it. It was on the Pennsylvania network. He could call everybody everywhere. We consider that astronomical advancement in technology. Oh, my God, that was just way be, you know, now you go down to the house, they all got computers on their desk and everything is so complicated. But it, uh, that was a big step forward. I think uh, the assembly is uh, uh, has made progress in the use of technology, uh, and uh, there'll probably be more progress made in the future. What was an average session day like for you, or non-session day, either one? Oh, session days. Well, Monday was always kind of empty because that was the day that everybody was getting to, to Harrisburg, and the only real vote was the uh, roll call vote, which allowed you to get paid for that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you call the roll call vote up, and everyone runs up and pushes the button. I used that once. I was sneaky, but I did it for a good reason. Uh, every year, a dozen kids were dying in adult facilities in Pennsylvania, and I had to pass the Juvenile Act. I had to get kids out of adult prisons. Mm -hmm. So I went up to the speaker, Mr. Irvis, and I said, Mr. Irvis, do you mind if I run my juvenile act as the roll call vote today? And he said, Joe, it's a substantive bill. We never run substantive bills on, on Monday for the roll call vote. I said, it's the only way I can think of where we can get this doggone thing passed and stop killing kids in, in uh, adult facilities. Okay, okay, Joe, go ahead and try to do it. <laughs> so. So the, they called up my bill as uh, the roll call vote. <laughs> and members ran up to the floor and they just said yes, because that's all you do for the roll call. And they went back to their offices. <laughs> and then I, I, I told the clerk, you know, get it signed by the speaker right away <laughs> and sent to the Senate so they can't recall it. So the speaker signed it, the courier took it over to the Senate. And a lot of things are, are, are arcane in the legislature. One of the arcane things is when the House or the Senate has a bill, they physically have the bill, a blue back bill. They have it. 
and they give it to the other body or to the governor, and they don't have it anymore. And you cannot vote for a reconsideration if you don't have the bill. Uh, right. <laughs> and I got that juvenile act over the Senate. Bang! <laughs> I know it was a little bit uh, not dishonorable, but less than up front. But I was fighting for children's lives, and I'd almost do anything for them, anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you had a, there was a bit of game mission in the legislature. Mm -hmm. Still is. There's a little bit of that always. You just got to know why you're doing it, you know, for your vain glory or for some financial interest of somebody, or are you doing it for the good of the Commonwealth? I know... Everyone has a different notion of what is the good of the Commonwealth. I understand that. That's the risk you take. <laughs> you could be wrong. <laughs> but don't come in this assembly without some notion of what is in the interest of the Commonwealth. Oh, you're in the wrong place, brother. You're, you should be doing something else. Mm -hmm. well, you talked a, a little bit before we started about uh, uh, you certainly were not alone in your office. You had multiple representatives in your Just office. Just my first year. Just your first year? Mm -hmm. first, first two years. And how about in terms of staff or secretaries? The first two years, I had I shared a secretary, Wilma, wonderful girl, uh, with three extremely uh, ambitious and busy members, all from Philadelphia, <laughs> black members from Philadelphia. So I went down to the chief clerks and I said to them, "Why do you put me in a room with three black guys from Philly? <laughs> I don't get it. Well, don't you want to be with black?" I said, "Are you confused? I'm from Pittsburgh." I want to be with Allegheny County people. <laughs> I don't care about this and that. But it was too late. They couldn't change it. So for, my, for two years, I spent a lot of time with these Philadelphians. I grew to have a lot of affection for some of them. And it helped me a lot get things done. One of them was Dave Richardson, who mm -hmm. subsequently died. But boy, Dave and I, we, we did a lot of things, a lot of things together. How about in terms of uh, mentors? You said you had uh, a lot of mentors along the way. Um, who are some of those, or spe more specifically in the House, and did you offer any mentorship before you left? I don't know if I was a mentor to anyone. I, I, I try to give some of the new guys, you know, suggestions. One of them was Bill DeWeese, <laughs> who lived in my building. Yeah. And I didn't mentor him, but we, we hanged out when, you know, I, in terms of myself, uh, a guy named Jim Ritter from uh, Allentown, he, he had accidentally had an office next to my office. Mm -hmm. And so we talked a lot, you know, and it was, you know, a guy from Pittsburgh wouldn't have any concept what a guy from Allentown would care about. And we got to know each other. Of course, my primary influence in my life in the legislature was Kay Leroy Irvis. Mm -hmm. He was my uh, idol, my uh, image, what, I, what I'd like to be, you know. And he was always willing to talk to me. How about uh, humorous stories? I know we talked a little bit off camera about some uh, humorous stories that are, are good-natured stories that we, uh, during your time in the house. Could you share some of those with us? Humorous stories. Well, I remember one which wasn't exactly humorous, but it was funny to me. <laughs> we had a bill on the calendar uh, in the Senate that wanted to make anyone who had an abortion a capital crime had been committed a capital crime and would be executed. <laughs> so we went, went to, uh, after session, uh, they had a big fight on the Senate floor. It didn't go anywhere. And I, after session, I was in Jimmy's, which is a little restaurant. It's now gone. It's a curio shop now on uh, Walnut Street. And I was in there with a bunch of buddies. And, and Tom Nolan came in, who was the majority leader of the Senate. <laughs> and one thing led to another. Maybe we had had a couple of drinks. I don't know. But... Uh, he and I start arguing about the abortion bill. You know, you, you execute someone who had an abortion. And I said, Tom, I know you. I know your kids. If one of your kids had an abortion, you wouldn't want him executed. I know you wouldn't do that. You, you're a decent guy. What are you talking about? Then he started to want to fisticuff me because I said he wouldn't kill his daughter. <laughs> and I, I was stunned. You know, I said, Tom, put your hands down. No, we're not going to fight to prove that you would kill your daughter. No, I don't think so, because I know you wouldn't. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that happened. There are other things that happened that were funny. But, uh, huh, I can't recall anyone that stands out right now.
I know when we uh, talked to Representative James Kelly in the past, uh, he quoted that uh, you often, what he termed, babysitted his his his, his son, I guess, and yeah. during session. Yeah, we played X and O's. Yeah, <laughs> for hours. Hours, because you know <laughs> session is boring most of the time. So we he'd come over, he was sitting under my desk, and we would play X and O's for hours. You know, I really enjoyed that. I I I got close to Jim. I really liked him a lot. Well, why did you end up leaving the House of Representatives then, in 1980? I didn't really leave. Mm -hmm. I decided to run for the U.S. Senate. <laughs> How was that experience different than running for a House seat? Oh, God. Right. In every possible way. We were all sitting on the floor one day, and everyone was talking about who's going to run for the Senate, from the, you know, this and that. And somebody said, Joe, why don't you run? I mean, you're more qualified, and you make a better senator than all these other guys. I said, you're right. I should run. <laughs> so I started circulating petitions, and I got on the ballot. Uh, I think the hardest part about me running for the Senate was um, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Some other areas of the Commonwealth were hard. You know, we have some very tough counties to, for a black guy to run in. But since I was married to a white woman, and a lot of people ate much, much of that, mm -hmm. uh, I I go to Philly to campaign. Oh gosh, sometimes it was all kinds of. But I had a lot of supporters in Philly, and and, they, mm -hmm. uh, and I was surprised that my, one of my opponents was C. Dolores Tucker because I had really take stuck my neck out for her once, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, but you know she ran, and I didn't have a lot of money, you know. And Pete Flaherty had a very good name recognition number across the state and I remember the one thing happened uh, right in the heat of the battle when they were attacking me for being married to a white woman which I thought was so old-fashioned <laughs> what were these wake up we're in the 19th 20th century I mean you know give me a break she's the mother of my children any well she wasn't at that point but she would be yeah. uh, I remember I went the, the mine workers endorsed me for the Senate which startled me because I thought, why would the mine workers endorse me? But all these years, I've always been able to rely on the mine workers. I always did anything I could when I was on the Public Utility Commission. Mm -hmm. I did anything I could to help the mine workers. Anyway, they asked me to, to campaign with them for the Senate. Can't come down to Green County and go down in a mine, meet some of the mine workers, you know. So that's okay. So I went there with a couple of people, and we got all the garb on, you know, mm -hmm. and the breathe, breathing apparatus mm -hmm. and the... the you know, the helmet and all that stuff. We go way down this mine, I mean way down, maybe 1,500 feet down. And we're walking along uh, in a tunnel, and I see these three figures coming toward me, you know. And I thought, oh, what's, what's this all about? So they had picks and things that were coming toward me. So they got up to me, and I could see enough with my little bulb, my little light on top of my helmet, I could see they were all black women. <laughs> <laughs> and all these people in Philly were attacking me for not being married to a white woman. It was so funny. And one of the women came up to me with her pick, and she says, Joe, we had a meeting of the black women miners, <laughs> and we decided we're all going to march on Philly and teach those people they can't treat you like you're, they're treating you because <laughs> you're our man, and you make a great senator. And ball. I gave him a big hug. I'll, you know. I said, uh, Probably not a good idea for you to <laughs> march on Philly, <laughs> but I really appreciate Absolutely. what you said. It gave me a big boost for a week or two. What have, been, what have you been keeping yourself busy with since you've uh, been well, out you of know, the house? Well, you know, for uh, seven years I worked at uh, Westinghouse Corporation mm -hmm. in corporate planning. I, I didn't know anything about business, nothing, you know, and they, I learned, you know, dealing with deals, you know, Many millions of dollars of deals I had to really understand fast, you know. So I learned a lot about the world of business. Uh, and then my ex-wife, Linda, uh, she was nominated by Casey to become Secretary of Aging. Mm -hmm. And she said, I really appreciate it if you'd come with me and the kids to, to Harrisburg. I said, okay. So I went, left my job, just when I was getting to a certain point in West you know, where I could really do something. And uh, Governor Casey asked me to be the deputy in commerce because they, they had a lot of trouble in commerce. Uh, and 
the secretary couldn't get confirmed because the, some of the Republicans in the Senate were making a fuss over nothing. So I had to take care of a lot of the details. Mm -hmm. And then after a year of that, uh, the governor had kept, Governor Casey had kept saying names over uh, to the Senate to be PUC commissioners. And it had all been rejected <laughs> by the Senate. So he, so he sent me, he sent word to me through one of his people that we'd like to nominate you for the Office of Public Utility Commission. I said, I don't know about the Public Utility Commission. Or, you know, he said, because when I was in the legislature, I was in criminal justice and juvenile law. And all that. Don't worry, Joe, you'll pick it up. So he nominated me. And uh, there's a lot of fuss about it and everything. Uh, but uh, I got confirmed unanimously by the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I served seven years as a public utility commissioner. That was what I did from uh, 88 till 95. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, because on the PUC, you only have to convince two other people to get something done, because there's five of us. Mm -hmm. Lots of times, not even five. I served in the commission, there was only two of us. <laughs> I had to convince him <laughs> or her <laughs> to go along with me. You know? And, uh, but the PC was different than the legislature, you know, because the legislature passes these big, broad bills and the budget and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of, you know, very broad and, mm -hmm. you know, broad s swath of things. That happens in the PC too, when you pass rate increases. But the, a lot of the work of the commission is little deals, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I enjoyed doing that, you know. Uh, I got involved in lots of little things. Settling disputes between the mine workers and the utilities who didn't want to buy their coal from a certain people or something like that. And uh, the one thing I got really interested in the PUC was railroad crossings. Nobody was, none of the commissioners were particularly interested in railroad crossings. So I took that on as the interest. I, the commission has the authority to establish the rules around railroad crossings. <laughs> and so I got really into that. And uh, that sounds like a minor thing, but when you get hit by a locomotive going 60 miles an hour with 100 cars behind it, mm -hmm. you're dead. Yeah. And uh, I remember one time I got, a, I got a call from the safety people saying there was been a railroad crossing accident out in uh, Pittsburgh uh, on the north side. I said, the first question you always ask, anybody survive? <laughs> he said, no. I said, how did it happen? I said, this guy uh, had gone to a, Pittsburgh, a Pitt basketball game or something like that and driven down to this little hall on, on, the, on the Allegheny River where there was like a sort of a, you know, how do you put it without using appropriate language? Uh, uh, less than middle class people lived <laughs> in little trailers and things. And he, and, he took, and he went over there to see his girl. And when he, when he left, he had to cross the railroad tracks. And as he was crossing the railroad tracks, he, there was a crossbar, and the light in the middle of the crossbar was out, so it didn't blink. And uh, he assumed, as he should assume, that there was no train. Uh, had he waited two seconds, he would have seen the train. <laughs> you know, If he had gone two seconds before that, he would have gotten across the tracks. But he, he, that precise moment, I don't know whether it was fate or whatnot, he goes across the tracks in this big, Three locomotive unit train comes by and wham! It took him about a mile to stop, and he's all mushed up and everything. And they called me up and said, "What are we going to do, Commissioner?" I said, "Well, simple question: Has anybody replaced the bulb in the crossing light?" No, Commissioner. Why not? No one will agree it's their responsibility. I said, "You are kidding me." So we call a pen dot, we call the, the Conrail, we call the the township, hmm. said, will you go out there and put a bulb in that blankety blank signal? It's not our responsibility. We won't touch it. It's not our responsibility. So after a while, I got really steamed. So I told my people, I said, get me a plane to Pittsburgh in a car. Get me a light bulb. I mean, a bulb that could go into that thing and get all those people on the phone. I said, these are all presidents of these things. I said, sirs? I am going to go to the airport and catch a plane to Pittsburgh, and I'm going to have a press conference right there where that, was, that poor boy got mushed, and I'm going to put this lamp 
into the into the cross into the cross signal unless one of you goes out there and fixes it. So I drove out to uh, uh, to the Harrisburg Airport. Uh, just before I got there, the phone rang in the car, and it's Commissioner. Yeah, this is this is safety officer. Yeah, right, right, right. You don't have to go. Why? The light bulb was installed. Who did it? I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah. So you get involved. You know, I'm the, I was, my job at the PUC was, in a way, same as my job as a legislator. Take care of the people of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And don't let the bureaucrats kill them. You know, nothing like a railroad crossing accident. I mean, nothing like that. But since then, since being on the PUC, I've been just doing consul consulting work for one of the leaders in this house and also for various large corporations. And that kept me busy. How about uh, any regret? About serving? About serving, yeah, your service in the house. Or uh, any issues you think you maybe should have pushed harder on? Uh, the only bill, only subject matter that I, that I never got enacted, which I always, which later on was enacted, I always felt bad about was uh, boarding homes. And I, I asked people, how do we get this boarding home bill passed? And so people would just tell me point blank, you've got to have a disaster at a boarding home where nothing but white older people get killed. I said, that's a hard one to take. But that's what got the Juvenile Act passed, you know, some Juveniles were killed in a fire at Lycoming County Jail. Mm. Uh, so, lo and behold, in March of 1979, there was a fire in a boarding home in Connellsville where they had steps going down to the basin where they kept all the senior citizens in wheelchairs. Mm. Steps in wheelchairs. Right? And, of course, none of them got out. You know, a dozen people were killed. Mm. And I said, oh, Lord. This is it. We have to move on this now, this boarding hall issue. Unfortunately, nobody paid any attention because that day <coughs> was the day that Three Mile Island happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Timing, yeah. And the whole world was looking at Three Mile Island for, for a high-tech disaster, mm -hmm. <laughs> which never happened because the, the reactor worked the way it was supposed to. It was well-designed, and it shut itself down and melted. That's what it was supposed to do. <laughs> Meanwhile, a very old-fashioned form of heat uh, fire, mm -hmm. kill all these people in Connellsville. So, you know, there's a lot of luck involved with right. serving the people. A lot of luck. Overall, how do you feel about your contributions to the legislative process? I did my duty, as I saw it, just like I did on the Scranton Commission. Uh, you could always do more but there's only so much a man can do. And I did everything I thought I could do. Um, I tried as hard as I could, but that's why there's 203 members of the house. You know, <laughs> you know there are other people have a say in what should happen and what not happen. And, uh, I don't think I have a, an exclusive uh, contract or you know, arrangement to know the truth. I don't, that's how we have a big body. People argue and the truth comes out, sort of. But no, I, I'm not ashamed of what I did in the assembly. I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of what I did on the PUC. I'm proud of what I did on the Scranton Commission. I'm proud of what I did in, as Deputy of Commerce. I've had a good public life. I got a chance to serve the people. There's no greater joy than that. I don't mean to sound corny, but that, that's exactly how I feel. Do you have any advice for any others who would have a pursue a career in public service? Well, I always tell people when they talk about Harrisburg, I tell them one thing. If you're going to survive in Harrisburg, in any job, any political job, any state job, the only way to survive you have to develop a keen, not a casual, but a keen delight in the perverse. <laughs> so things will happen to you, you know, and, and things will happen and you'll go, wow, how could they have done that? <laughs> what? How could he have done that? That's really perverse. <laughs> but if you chuckle, 
you can get through it. Uh, if you get so serious that it, you know, you can't see uh, the delight in the perverse, you're, go you're a goner in the assembly or anywhere, the governor's office, anywhere, in any of the judgeships. Nobody is that right all the time. So uh, where does where does Joe Rhodes go from here? I'm retired, you know. I, my kids are all grown up now. Uh, I might go back to finishing my book on Thomas Carlyle and John Stuart Mill, which I wrote at oh. Harvard, and it's I wrote it, but I didn't like it much. 450 pages, but I didn't I didn't like it, so yeah. I, I let it sit for 20 years. I'm, I have time now. Maybe I'll go back and look at the draft. The basic gist of it is right, but the, you know, some of it is uh, not good prose. So I'll see. I might do that. People ask me to consult on different things, mm -hmm. uh, and I do it. But I always tell them, you don't buy my judgment or my word. You hire me to do something. You have to understand, I'll do what I think is right, mm -hmm. and I'll say what I think is the truth. And if you can't handle that, don't hire me. That's why I haven't had a lot of clients lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to say, Representative Rhodes, it's been a, a fantastic interview, and I appreciate you coming in this afternoon. Um, this is where we can end it, if you'd like. No, fine. And uh, I wish you uh, uh, much luck. And uh, I, again, I appreciate you coming in for and spending time with us today. This is all part of my duty to the Commonwealth, and I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you.